the ultimate voice of Bangladesh on environmental law. Uh, she is a star advocate in the Supreme Court of Bangladesh, and we're very happy to welcome her onto our um, seminar today. Uh, she's been working as the chief executive of Bangladesh Environmental Lawyers Association, Bela. Her work uh, was recognized, and uh, she was awarded the Goldman Environmental Prize in 2009, as also the Raman Magsaysay Award in 2012 for her uncompromising courage and impassioned leadership in a campaign of judicial activism in Bangladesh that affirms the people's right to a good environment as nothing less than their right to dignity and life. This is what the award read as. Her organization, Bela, has received several international awards including most recently the Tang Prize 2020 in the category Rule of Law. We are very proud and extremely fortunate um, that advocate Saida Rizwana Hassan is with us. Ma'am, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Vidya. Uh, in Bangladesh, we actually uh, call people APA or call them by name to... Uh, give them a level of comfort. If you call me madam, I'll feel as if I'm elevated to a level from which I'll not be able to communicate with you. You are elevated, but you are still our APA. Yes. Call me by name. I, I'm known as Rizwana. See, I didn't know it's going to be such a, uh, you know, organized uh, discussion. So I haven't really prepared anything. I've just got my pen here and my diary. I've just uh, noted down a few things. I don't know if you really want to get into a very legal discussion on this, because I agree with whatever uh, Jyotirmoy has said about making the government and the corporation accountable, but there is a political dimension to it. I would like to tell you that we are living in an era now in Bangladesh in a particular phase in Bangladesh where our democracy has been very badly defeated. You can still think of people's protest in India, but I don't think we can think of um, a mass gathering of 200 people protesting against a power plant. If we do, yes, there have been incidents. So there was an incident back in 2004, I don't remember the exact year, where people of a given... Uh, area of Bangladesh protested against the government's plan to go for open mining of coal. And the protest was so powerful that the government from Dhaka had to send special envoy to that local area, pacify people, tell them that no, we are not going to go for open pit mining. And they had to sign an agreement. It was so forceful that even after so many years, the government hasn't been able to finalize its coal policy. Because it wants to finalize the coal policy, but it wants to keep provision for export there. It wants to keep provision of open pit mining in it. And that is just not becoming possible because of what the government faced there. But then 10 years, 12 years down the road, when people protest against having coal-based power plant in, in a place very close to Shundarbans, and a project that is posing definite risks to the uh, largest mangrove forest of the world, the government has shown the strength. You know, a professor of the university, Professor Anu Muhammad, who is basically leading the um, campaigns, he was brutally beaten up by the police to an extent that his legs were broken. He had to be hospitalized. And the next day, we saw the ministers going to see him. So you see, if you want to consider or kind of capture the entire governance picture here in Bangladesh, it's actually very clumsy. There is no particular rhythm or particular tone that it's following. So one day your police is beating him up. What would Professor Anu Muhammad do? Does he have the ability to set fire in a public transportation? I mean, do we, do we see him as a person of... Uh, that kind of an attitude, does the government believe that he would actually be causing deterioration of law and order? His whole plan was to go to the, to have a march towards the energy ministry and hand over some memorandum. I don't think, Jyotimoy, 
that with the finest advocates of the country and with the weakest of the law that we have in hand and the constitutional spirit that we all believe in, if we go to the court, it will be any easy for us anymore. I don't think so. We have, not us, but other groups have, their, have tried their luck with the Rampal power plant. And Rampal power plant is criticized not only by people like Anu Muhammad or you and me, it has been criticized by UNESCO. The government on the face of UNESCO uh, criticism has said that they are abandoning the second phase of the Rampal power plant, but they're sticking to the first one because the government thinks it will be a political defeat for them again. After the Asia energy defeat in Dinajpur, if they accept this defeat, they'll never be able to you know, implement any coal-based plant. So they... There are other political dimensions to it. It's not only a Bangladesh project, it's a Bangladesh-India project. So when the negotiation takes place in UNESCO, it's not only Bangladesh throwing its political weightage, it is also India coming in. It's also China coming in because China has interest in another coal-based power plant nearby and they'll be using the same river route. It is the Bangladesh-India-China political power that is not allowing the political decision-making platform of UNESCO to say no to it. But the scientific platform of it, led by IUCN, has already said no to it. So you see, I don't think we will have much luck in the high court nowadays if, we, if you want to challenge the, um, you know, uh, uh, the, the propositions of the government of, in, of Bangladesh in the coal policy about developing the ability of the national sector in, in dealing with coal uh, or about the, pro the, the proposal of the government to still export the coal when the national demand will, also, will not be met. I mean, if you, if you take a long-term scenario, the coal that we have in hand, if we extract all of it, that will not uh, you know, meet our demand after a given uh, phase. And now you have the whole climate debate in the scene, whether to uh, at all ask for capacity building of the national institutions for, for coal or to say completely no to coal and switch to renewable for which Bangladesh has excellent prospect. So coming back to the, to the whole issue of, so, so you, can't, you, can't, uh, we, you can't really separate the energy immunity from the total governance picture, from the entire uh, picture of democracy. When you don't have a government which is, uh, I mean, in all respect, elected. Yes, yes, there was an election. I don't deny that. But there were hardly any voters. And a very um, minimum um, percentage of voters' uh, votes have been counted. I mean, these are all public documents. Asking for accountability for that sort of a government is an extra challenge. When your democracy functions, even, even the weakest form of democracy uh, has some empowering element for the people for civil society movements. But uh, with this form of a democracy, it's extra challenging. And, and where you have an opposition which is totally a domesticated opposition, and the actual opposition has been silenced, and journalists are being arrested after two and a half months. Well, previously you would find their uh, dead bodies floating in the rivers. Now you don't see that anymore. What you see is the journalist has been released after has, has come out from somewhere. I can't say has been released officially, has come out from somewhere. And then the uh, law enforcing agency is filing case against him for failing to produce passport on demand. I mean, do, you, do we all move around in our own countries with passports in hand? And, and the social media, the way it's being um, observed and monitored by the government. So that's the overall governance scenario. When we talk about coal or gas or electricity, I think in all sectors we have created precedents about how to give immunity to these players. I mean, ADB and World Bank can give you prescriptions, but if your own policies are not properly designed, um, then there is hardly any scope for the civil society actors to reap benefit and question ADB and World Bank. So who do you question first, ADB World Bank, or you question your government first? If I want to question my government first, I do not know how things are happening here in Bangladesh. There was a Canadian company. I told you that we have 
as many as 10 versions of draft coal policy. Not a single one has been finalized, but we have moved from one coal project to 29 coal projects without a policy in hand. Come to gas now. A Canadian company came to Bangladesh, wanted to work on our abundant and marginalized gas field. They got a contract. Uh, they set fire in one given gas field twice. So we, we took a case to the High Court Division saying that this, this company has to compensate. And this agreement has to be declared void and void ab initio because it was actually uh, executed by misuse of power. The court said the contract is legal. Why is it legal? Because successive prime ministers have endorsed. One endorsed the policy and the other one endorsed the agreement. So if the prime ministers endorse, it can't be wrong. How it, only these three lines against our 2000 page petition and then so it was legal but the company has to pay compensation then the company went to exit so you now have it's not only bangladesh judiciary you have platforms like exit so they went to the international tribunal there the government of bangladesh lost and the government of bangladesh was directed to pay back all the dues of the gas company and then the government was shaken because it is this NICO deal based on which the former prime minister has been jailed. So subsequently we saw that another round of a case was filed before the High Court and the High Court this time said that the agreement was illegal. So these are the institutions you are dealing with. One has to be at that also in mind. Okay, so I would rather stop here. I would just tell you that we don't have clear policies here in Bangladesh. Whatever we have are administrative decisions, they are heavily biased and in, in much in favor of the companies and they're often taken without consultation with the people. We don't have a very elaborate EIA system, EIA regime in Bangladesh. Land is first acquired and then EIA is done, which is not the case in India. So one, once you acquire the land, investing so much of money, you can't expect the government to backtrack and say that the acquisition was actually wrong. We are giving people back their land. The law won't permit it. We Finally, we had an incident in 2015 where local people protested against the coal project. The police and army opened fire. Seven people died. Uh, but then the, the owner of the, the proponent is so powerful, so powerful, so powerful that the Navy was probably deployed. Either Navy or Air Force, I don't remember. They then started dealing with the land acquisition process. You know, when, the, when they started with it, nobody even dared to say that we are not getting enough compensation. So all the voices were suppressed and there was no, no legal case uh, in favor of the government, in, in favor of the people. So this is where we uh, stand today. Every time you're, you're being presented with a coal, saying that it's cheap. It's not actually cheap because nobody takes into consideration the environmental and social cost of it. Okay, and I don't think we have institutions in hand where we can go and challenge decisions that are not economic, that are not because of energy, but because of financial interests of the government people. We don't have an institution that would actually accept and would dare nowadays to say no to those uh, projects. That's what my feeling is. Thank you.